Well, welcome to Module 6. This is the last week in our Clinical Problem Solving course. Congratulations for making it this far. Uh, and this week we're going to do a quick review of the work that we've done and we're going to show you how to apply it to your skills in taking multiple choice tests relevant to medicine and also in teaching clinical problem solving. So there's something in it in this test in this module for both students and teachers alike. And we hope you stay until the end and then agree to take our end of the course survey, which you'll get in about a week. Once again, I wanna acknowledge all of my colleagues um, and who have been working on this. And I also thank you for the efforts that you've done um, to contribute to my understanding of how to teach this through your feedback this um, course. So module five, module five, remember we talked about human errors. We talked first about the importance of having enough knowledge to establish a differential diagnosis, choose the correct test. If you are gonna perform the test yourself, perform it correctly and then interpret the test correctly. And knowledge was one component of accurate diagnoses. So failing to understand things might cause human errors, but so um, were biases. Matt? showed you a way of going back to analyze your clinical problem solving once you knew that your initial diagnosis, community acquired pneumonia, was incorrect and in fact what the patient really had was hypersensitivity pneumonitis. He started of course with our patient illness script, initially a 66 year old woman who was felt to have acute pneumonia um, and who, for whom we missed a critical element of the history, the fact that she was a bird owner. So if we retraced our steps, our first error might have been um, a problem with um, identifying the right information and getting the right um, history from the patient. So instead of thinking that she had her cough, fevers, and shortness of breath for only three days, we should have been a little bit more diligent and found out that those symptoms have actually been going on for some time. Another way of making a mistake, as we talked about in the last slide, is that we didn't perform the test correctly. And if in fact our physical exam was performed such that we only identified Ronchi and missed the fact that she had crackles, that's another contributor to the error that we made in our diagnosis. And we could go on for each of these steps and identify ways in which we might be better the next time we face a patient um, who has similar signs and symptoms. So our goal for today is to help you understand how experts use their understanding of disease and the types of strategies we've been working on in clinical problem solving to um, build test questions. And we're going to go back and use our old friend, the compare and contrast reading, and our prioritized differential diagnoses to put together these questions. And once you learn how to put together questions, you'll also learn how to answer questions much more effectively and efficiently when faced with them on high stakes clinical exams like the national board exams. Then we're gonna spend some time um, working with tips that you can use to teach others how to use this method of clinical problem solving. And finally, um, before we end, we'll follow up on our patients and their problems and make sure everyone understands um, what was the result of our hard work in trying to investigate the problems of patients you met in week one. So remember, compare and contrast thinking is important because it helps reinforce understanding by connecting new information to previously stored information. Every time you access previously stored information, you're strengthening your brain's understanding of that. So using the opportunity to work with new patients and think a little bit about how you've learned um, about topics relevant to that patient will help um, build those important neural connections. The compare and contrast strategy builds that memory framework because you build connections between similar constructs and that reinforces and refines both of those diagnoses and makes it easy for you to access them in the clinical environment. And lastly, compare and contrast helps prioritize essential and differentiating features. So it tells you what are the most important facts and features to remember about each disease. So you can prioritize um, memorizing those elements and not pay as much attention to things that are a little bit more ambiguous or um, not particularly differentiating. We've been using vertical reading throughout um, our course. You identify a syndrome, a syndrome like acute dyspnea, or a syndrome like, which I know there's a lot of controversy on the homework about this, um, aseptic meningitis, that's meningitis without an obvious um, organism present, 
And then you identify a diagnostic triad, like diseases that can cause those specific syndromes. As many of you have recognized throughout this course, the diagnostic triad are the three diseases you pick to compare and contrast for this particular syndrome um, are somewhat random uh, because there are many, many diseases that cause a particular given syndrome. But we pick three because it makes it easy for us to, to um, engage in this compare and contrast exercise and build those memory networks. And then when you've got those down, you can do another diagnostic triad relevant to that syndrome. And then we asked you to complete a, a vertical reading table. The syndrome features were features that are seen in all three of the diseases in your diagnostic triad. A distinguishing feature um, are features or facts about diseases that are only seen in two out of those three. So um, if, the, if there's a distinguishing feature present, it allows you to eliminate one of those diagnoses. And a key feature is unique in this triad to a single disease. Um, and then there's a final type of feature we talked about as well, the rejecting feature. And that's a feature that is never seen in any of these um, particular conditions. So if in fact it's present, that's not um, the diagnosis that you should be considering. So here's some examples of diagnostic triads and we've posted them on the web for you too in case you want to begin to um, coordinate your reading around these. So a diagnostic triad for the syndrome of acute dyspnea might include pulmonary embolus, congestive heart failure, or pneumonia. One for jaundice might include hepatitis, cholangitis, or hemolytic anemia. One for vertigo might include benign positional vertigo, Meniere's disease, or a brainstem stroke. So you get the point. Um, I could actually change this for jaundice to include um, hemolytic anemia um, or um, uh, granulomatous hepatitis. And here's, of course, uh, one of the vertical reading tables you've been used to completing. This one looks at the syndrome of paraparesis and gives you transverse myelitis, epidural abscess, and Guillain-Barre. And of course, um, in completing these, I want to remind you, you don't have to fill out every square, um, just a square where there is something very relevant to the way in which you want to learn about these diseases. And some of you found that the Venn diagrams were more helpful, um, recalling that a differentiating feature seen in two out of three diseases, a key feature in this diagnostic triad present only in one. We used those vertical reading tools and the Venn diagram tools to identify these very important features so that we could construct our disease-based illness script. And remember, the disease-based illness script includes four elements for each disease. This is the way experts understand diseases. A statement about epidemiology. Epidemiology, as we've talked about um, several times and was um, a hot topic on the chat rooms, includes not just age, gender, race, or ethnicity. In fact, race and ethnicity often aren't very relevant here. But it also includes exposures or uh, risk factors due to current diseases. So it might include the fact that the patient is immunocompromised because they have HIV infection. It might include the fact that they are a traveler because they are presenting with a fever. It also includes the time course statement, subacute, acute, chronic, hyperacute, um, and a clinical presentation, which is a set of signs and symptoms that are classic for this particular disease. And finally, a statement about mechanisms of disease. And the more sophisticated you get as you begin to learn about diseases, the deeper your understanding is about the mechanisms. So um, this helps us understand diseases and read to remember a little bit more effectively. So when a patient presents, we are able to obtain data using history and physical and then develop the patient's illness script. Several steps to that, simple problem list, where we just list all of the problems that the patient has, identified through the history and physical and sometimes lab tests, process that problem list, both qualitatively, for instance, dyspnea rather than short of breath, shortness of breath, temporally, acute or chronic, or summatively, uh, the syndromes of sepsis or congestive heart failure or aseptic meningitis. And then put those together from that process problem list into a patient illness script that is essentially similar in structure to a disease-based illness script. And we do this very deliberately so that we can compare a patient illness script to the disease illness script and make matching um, a, much more easier a much easier task. 
as we see here. Finally, we use the comparison between our patient's illness script and our disease-based illness script to tier the likelihood that, the patient, that a given disease is the cause of the patient's symptoms. And we said a tier one possibility on the um, likelihood ruler here was clinically high likelihood, either likely or very likely. And that happened when the disease under consideration explained all of the patient's major findings and the patient had all the major manifestations of that disease and they had no rejecting features. They might even have a key feature. At the other end of the heuristic ruler was a tier three possibility, unlikely or very unlikely. And that occurred, or that was the appropriate category, if the disease under consideration um, had uh, only an ability only to explain a single or uh, maybe a couple of features of the patient's presentation, or if the patient had a rejecting feature of the disease in question. And in between, we call this uncertainty or moderate likelihood. So how does this help us understand how test questions are written? Well, the goals of good test questions are to differentiate between those who have an acceptable level of knowledge and problem solving skill and those who are somewhat less qualified. Now, sometimes tests are used in a way we call formatively, meaning to give you a, a sense of where you stand so you can study more and perform better. But sometimes they're used summatively to decide whether you um, advance to the next level of medical school, um, pass your boards and are allowed to start your internship, or pass your boards at the end of residency and are allowed to call yourself board certified. And in a perfect world, a goal of good testing um, should be questions that test more than factual recall. After all, you can look up a particular uh, biochemical pathway in the, uh, on the computer or the dose of a particular drug. So we really want to spend our time more on questions that require you to analyze, interpret, and synthesize data rather than those that just ask you to remember facts. So this is what we do. First, you start with a testing objective. Um, it might read something like this. The good physician should be able to differentiate between the clinical presentation of mononucleosis and strep throat. That's a perfectly good testing objective. And we actually might even say that a third year medical student should be able to differentiate between that, between those two entities because they're so common. Then we're gonna build a clinical case. And this clinical case is um, gonna be built not out of memory, but um, as what I'd call a convenient fiction. Uh, and you'll see in a minute how we stack the deck towards the diagnoses we're trying to emphasize. Then we're gonna identify what's the right question to test this objective, add the correct answer to the question, and then several distractors. And distractors, of course, are those wrong answers. Um, if the answer is B, it's A, C, and D. So here's the core framework of a test question. There's a STEM. And the stem is very simple. For instance, a 15-year-old man with a sore throat is the, core, is the initial core stem. And the question I'm going to ask, because I want to get at that objective, is which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? Um, so I'm going to build a case um, that tells a story, a convenient fiction about this male with sore throat, um, and then get them to choose whether or not the patient could have strep throat, acute HIV infection, infectious mono, or viral URI. And of course, all of you are sitting here thinking, you know what, that's a diagnostic triad. And in fact, it is. And that's exactly the relevance in sort of understanding what diagnoses can be linked to common symptoms, because you'll see this a lot on high stakes exams. So how do I build the clinical stem beyond that 15-year-old man with a sore throat? Well, I'm going to start with a key in differentiating facts for the primary diagnosis that's going to be the right answer. So if the correct answer for this particular question is going to be infectious mononucleosis, then the key and differentiating features we identified through our vertical reading or through our um, Venn diagrams were sore throat that, was last, that lasted at least a week, not everybody has sore throat for a week, for more than a week, but that's very characteristic of mono. Exudative pharyngitis, that was very characteristic of mono. Um, left upper quadrant pain, that was the splenomegaly, right? Um, posterior cervical nodes, remember that was actually almost a key feature in this diagnostic triad between HIV, 
acute HIV, um, beta hemolytic strep throat, and uh, infectious mononucleosis, and hepatitis. So I'm going to sort of say, okay, I'm going to try and work these into a story. That'll be my convenient fiction to show people I'm creating a case that looks like infectious mononucleosis. So it might look like something like this. Here's our 15-year-old man, complains of sore throat for 10 days, getting progressively wor worse. In addition, he complains of abdominal pain in the left upper quadrant, and today his eyes are yellow. He is febrile with slightly jaundiced sclera. His pharynx is inflamed with tonsillar exudates. There's diffuse anterior and posterior cervical nodes present. Splenomegaly is noted along with tender hepatomegaly. After that, because this case here is really a very strong case for infectious mononucleosis, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and trip you up by adding some distractors to the case to try and lure you into choosing something other than the right answer. And this is exactly how we build cases. So we talked about the case being very good for infectious mononucleosis, and we're going to throw in some red herrings, as they would say in the States. That's sort of a distractor. He's sexually active with one partner, okay, so we want to give him a history that might be compatible with acute HIV. His younger sister has a history of strep pharyngitis. Well, now he's got an exposure history, right? Um, and his nose is slightly stuffy. That might make you think, well, maybe this is just a viral upper respiratory tract infection. So getting the answer right requires that compare and contrast thinking. So you were thinking this might be um, infectious mononucleosis, and then they added this concern that his younger sister has a history of strep pharyngitis. But you know from your reading that this syndrome that he has going on for 10 days is way too long for strep, and strep infection doesn't cause posterior nodes, splenomegaly, or hepatitis. That's what you got from your reading and compare and contrast vertical reading uh, for these two entities. His nose is slightly stuffy, but we can explain that away because enlarged tonsils can cause a stuffy nose. And upper respiratory tract infections, those viral URIs, don't typically cause hepatosplenomegaly or posterior cervical nodes. Very unusual. And you know that again from reading. He's sexually active with one partner. Well, that does give him a risk factor for HIV. Um, but as we know from our reading, acute HIV usually has oral ulcers and may in fact have aseptic meningitis. So um, I just created a question uh, that could be used for any of the conditions that we talked about here, but we constructed it so that the answer was what's the cause of this infection and the answer is acute mononucleosis. Um, we could, in fact, ask another um, question with the same stem. We could, in fact, ask a series of questions about what's the organism responsible for this clinical presentation, and they'd have to say it was Epstein-Barr virus, or what's the appropriate treatment for this condition, or what's the appropriate diagnostic test. Um, but the processing and the illness scripts are still relevant because um, all of these questions would require you to do an accurate diagnostic assessment before you're able to answer each of them. So if I was writing tests, test questions for a particular organization, I could get four or five questions out of this um, particular STEM, um, just what we've constructed today. So let me test your understanding. If you were going to change the STEM of this question to more accurately suggest that the right answer was group A strep infection, how would you change it? Would you A or 1 shorten the duration of symptoms? B, increase the age of the patient from 15 to 30, sorry, that's two, or three, add palatal ulcers to the presentation. Well, the answer, of course, is that you'd shorten the duration of symptoms. So if instead of a convenient fiction showing you that the most likely answer was infectious mononucleosis, if you said he's got symptoms for three days, that's going to make me think more of strep throat. Of course, you'd also have to get rid of the hepatosplenomegaly and the posterior cervical nodes, but this would be the first step. Um, increasing the age of the patient from 15 to 30 wouldn't make sense because strep throat doesn't usually affect adults that much. And adding pal palatal ulcers would not be the right answer um, for a group A strep infection. But if you wanted to change the, the question to make it more likely to be acute HIV, this would be the right answer. Does this make sense to you? Good.